Hello everybody, this is Jake Wynn from the National Museum of Civil War Medicine, coming at you for another one of our digital history programs that we've been doing during the pandemic. I'm joined today by historian Katie Shively. Katie, hello. Hello, thanks for having me. Thanks for being here. And we'll get to that program in just a second in our conversation, but before we get into that conversation, do want to talk a little bit about what we are doing at the National Museum of Civil War Medicine during this uh, unprecedented time that we're all going through. Many of you who have been here and watching many of these videos, you've heard this before. Uh, we are a member supported institution. If you do support these programs, these videos that we've been doing, the social media uh, blog posts and posts that we've been doing, and you want to support that, you can become a member. You can go over to the comment section of this video and you can click there and become a member or a donor. And those dollars go directly to support programs like this and to keep us sustained and doing these kinds of operations, even though we are still getting back towards where we can actually open the doors of our three museums, the National Museum of Civil War Medicine, the Fry House Field Hospital Museum, and the Clara Barton Missing Soldiers Office Museum as well. So, Katie, I'm going to jump right over to you. Um, if you would, just kind of give a little bit of an introduction of yourself, uh, who you are, and how you came to uh, study Civil War history. Sure. Um, well, I'm an associate professor of history at Virginia Commonwealth University in Richmond. So I'm here in the kind of overcast Richmond, Virginia uh, climbs today. And um, I am a historian of the Civil War, military history, environmental history, and medical history. Um, and I Currently, I'm kind of winding down an appointment as the Associate Director of Science, Technology, and Society at VCU. So that's a little bit about me. Um, how I came to the Civil War um, and Civil War medicine, was that the next part of the question? Yeah, yeah, how, how you got into the Civil War, Civil War history, and then also how it kind of got tied into medicine. To medicine. Um, well, I'm originally from Southern California, so I'm not sort of your typical um, Civil War buff, but as long as I can remember um, from when I was a little girl, I was really interested in American soldiers and their mental health um, because I um, had great adoration and admiration for my grandfather, who was a World War II vet, and he was a very reticent man um, who seemed troubled by his experience, but um, we never really got to connect about that. Um, so I think that just sort of planted seeds. And then, you know, I was more into the early American period. So I did my time buffing around all the early American wars, like many future military historians. Um, and I actually did my undergraduate degree in English um, poetry <laughs> in particular, and decided that that wasn't very practical. So I ended up going to grad school um, you know, in my hobby area, which was military history. And I ended up studying with Gary Gallagher um, at the University of Virginia. And um, while I was there, I became introduced to environmental history um, through the Science, Technology, and Society program um, at Virginia. And um, STS, as we call it for short, uh, might not be something that viewers are familiar with. Um, but it's an interdisciplinary approach to the sciences and to, and to medicine. Um, and what it does is use humanities and social sciences to um, critique and better understand how science and medicine operate in society. And I think one of the things that really intrigued me about that um, multidisciplinary approach um, was the way that it looked at epistemology or how um, humans come to know things, right? How humans um, develop knowledge, frame knowledge, um, frame expertise, those, those sorts of things, you know, use their experiences to develop knowledge. So once I started reading kind of like hundreds of Civil War soldier letters, um, all of these pieces fell into place for me. Um, because what I noticed um, in soldier letters is that every Civil War soldier opens up their letter talking about their health and the environment. <laughs> so I thought, you know, that's interesting and it's so banal and so commonplace that 
scholars haven't talked about it, right? So I started to kind of explore that for myself. And, and you know, what I, what I learned was that 19th century Americans um, found mental and physical health to be um, linked to one another. And that in addition, they found them to be linked to environment um, or to the world around them. And this sort of took me in the direction of, of medicine, um, which is a place I didn't know that I was going to end up. But suddenly I was ensconced in the world, like the social history of Civil War soldier health. And um, that, you know, then took me more, you know, I had to understand the world of Civil War surgeons. I had to understand 19th century medicine. Um, so even though a lot of that, um, if I'm honest, got cut from the book because that happens, you know, when the press is saying your book's a little long, we have to hack it down, um, you know, some of that work ended up going into essays and, and kind of other venues. But um, in addition to looking at soldier health, I became really interested in um, how Civil War doctors and veterinarians were framing their expertise because the Civil War became a platform for trying to convince the public that they had specialized knowledge when there weren't standards and, you know, typical the schooling that we think of. Um, so basically, I mean, it is a project. My, my first book is a project about um, how people framed their knowledge and understood their natural environment and how it connected to their bodies. Yeah, so you, you mentioned your book, uh, Nature Civil War, which is a favorite of mine going back a couple of years. Uh, when I first started at the National Museum of Civil War Medicine back in, I started there in 2013, I believe I read your book in 2015, and it's long been a, a, a favorite of mine. Uh, so. I want to talk a little bit about the, the book kind of more specifically here. Uh, it does focus on events in Virginia in 1862. What focused you on that particular time period on that particular topic? Yeah, um, a good question. And there's, there's a lot of different answers to that. Um, you know, this, this was my first book and it was based on my dissertation. Um, so there's a certain amount of just expediency, right? It's like, I was in Virginia studying at the University of Virginia. Um, and if I'm completely honest with you, that is the main reason that my case study was Virginia. It's because Virginia has phenomenal archives and I wanted to do archival research and you know the archives were close by. Um, but what specifically drew me um, to a case study that involved comparing the peninsula and the peninsula campaign of 62 with the Shenandoah Valley campaign of 62 um, was once I started to read um, the scholarship and, and kind of dive into 19th century viewpoints, uh, in particular, a, a book by um, Conaveri Bolton Valencius on, it's called The Health of the Land. Um, that book helped me to understand that Americans at mid-century understood the South and the West as these virulent um, climates and landscapes that if you were not acclimated to them, you could go to those places and die, right? I mean, you would go, you would develop fevers, you might develop um, diarrhea, other sorts of, you know, dysentery, just dangerous um, bodily states. And in addition, they believed that those climates could drive you insane, you know, that, that your mental health could bottom out. Um, so just kind of knowing that there was this generalized idea and that Confederate soldiers were saying those sorts of things like, you know, fighting in the South is going to be to our advantage because we're acclimated and federal soldiers are not acclimated to this dangerous disease landscape. Um, I thought that was really interesting and uh, I wanted to explore that and see if it was true. Um, so the Shenandoah Valley was considered a healthful um, southern region, right? It kind of an Eden of health where people would go to recover from illness, whereas the peninsula was a swamp, um, you know, for the most part. It was considered um, a, a region of miasma, and, you know, this was one of the concept disease conceptions at the time, the miasma theory, um, that swamps and, you know, rot, um, feces, all these sorts of things like um, you know, disease would waft off of these and cause fevers, et cetera. Um, so the peninsula was seen as one of those regions. So I thought it'll be interesting to compare these two because, um, you know, the campaigns were simultaneous, at least at the beginning. Um, and then some of the soldiers and 
you know, from Jackson um, came over to the, the peninsula. Um, so that was one of the reasons that I was interested in those. And then there's also a particular interest in 1862 for me, um, which is that when soldiers first gathered in camps in 1861, they were decimated by contagious diseases, right? Um, the, you know, diphtheria, anything that was like, you know, a crowd disease, a disease that um, people who had been living in urban places would have gotten. All of these country boys were now in massive armies and they all became ill with contagious diseases. And I wanted to pick a time when soldiers had already moved through that phase um, because I wanted to catch them talking about diseases they thought were environmental in origin. So by 62, by the winter into spring of 62, many of them had passed through the first phase of seasoning. And they, I posited that they were in the second phase of seasoning, which was encountering or really describing at least um, these kind of environmental diseases um, as far as they were concerned. They felt that again, um, miasma, weather, climate, um, these sorts of things were making them ill um, with fevers, diarrhea, et cetera, and were lowering their spirits. And I wanted to put the spotlight on that. So 1862 um, was the right time to do that. And of course, looking back now, I'm like, oh, I should have, you know, I would have loved to get African American soldiers in there. So I'm like, I should have picked, you know, um, 63, and it would have been a different time. Um, you know, soldiers would have already been seasoned to some extent. Um, but you know, it's always looking back. You think I could have done it better. Um, but that is what I chose, and that is what I followed through with at the time. Yeah, it seems to me, you know, thinking about this topic. You know, it seems that this is a, a good choice, uh, 1862, because you're, you're these soldiers, many of them are going to be participating in their first real campaigns. You know, you think about First Bull Run and these soldiers, many of them, you know, go back out of the army and then some of them do re-enlist, but those armies were relatively small compared to the armies that are being fielded in the spring of 1862. And so suddenly they're getting out of the vicinity of Washington and going other places. And I'm sure that that gives you kind of a rich, gave you kind of a rich material, a very descriptive material, as these soldiers are not only experiencing these environments for the first time, but they're experiencing war at it, what we will come to know as the Civil War and its horrors for the first time. Right, and I think one of the points that you just brought up was very important to me, and that's that they were now in city-sized armies that were um, moving into landscapes and completely transforming them, right? Um, digging latrines, digging earthworks, um, you know, moving earth around, causing areas where water would pool and then insects would gather, or, you know, contaminating the ground with feces and then rain comes and washes it, you know, um, flies are gathering around um, bodies, right? Um, whether dead bodies or live bodies, right? They're, they're attracting these sorts of insects. So their, their experience, um, you know, experiences they would have had at home prior as farmers or whatever, um, those landscapes were not like what they were experiencing here, right? They, these were kind of, um, you know, transitory urban slums in some cases. Mm -hmm. And when I think of the, the Shenandoah Valley, you know, I think that landscape is so much more familiar to a lot of northern soldiers in particular, because, I mean, I'm from Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. I grew up in an area that looks almost exactly like the Shenandoah Valley, except right. the mountains are a little bit bigger. And, you know, those environments, I think for, for a lot of northern soldiers in particular, are much more, well, as you said, kind of hospitable to them, they, they believe, um, but also much more familiar than the, the kind of swampy, uh, awful areas of, of, the, uh, of the peninsula. Mm -hmm. Right. And there was definitely this perception um, that, you know, and even once they were there, they would describe them in different ways, these two environments. But unfortunately for them, um, in both cases, you're gathered together with lots of human beings and lots of animals. And that makes both environments insalubrious, right? That means that both areas are going to become disease environments, even if this was not necessarily, you know, as problematic for the valley before the war. Right. So another another element of this, and, and I have another question here, but I kind of want to ease into it, is so when we think of 1862 in Virginia, 
I'm thinking of, you know, these are some of the most descriptive accounts, especially the peninsula, these soldiers describing their environment. I think of all of the conflict and all of the fighting in Virginia, that 1862 spring peninsula campaign uh, creates some of the most descriptive, uh, and soldiers are writing about the swamps, they're writing about all of the disease that's being, you know, picked up, they're, they're talking about Chickahominy fever. Uh, I think of that time period in Virginia is the only other time that's really comparable is, you know, 1864 when we start entrenching and, and start, you know, completely changing the environment. But so in this 1862 spring time period, could you talk a little bit about the relationship between the soldiers and the environment at that stage of the war? Yeah, um, so, you know, I, I kind of started to talk about this, but um, they're in this kind of second stage seasoning where I feel like they were especially attuned um, to the interaction between their bodies, their minds or their morale um, and the environment around them, right? Because some of that mm -hmm. um, initial shock of like making first camps together, um, some of that had worn off and um, the kinds of things that they would describe um, would be, you know, it's rained for five days straight and I have rheumatism or rheumatic fever. They had all these different ways of describing, you know, um, what they felt they were experiencing. Um, headaches, sore throats, um, you know, stomach complaints. And then also they would describe um, their morale as taking serious dips, you know, in regards to what was happening with with the weather or with the terrain around them. Um, so they, you know, some of them would say, you know, I feel like giving up. I'm not, I'm not coming out of my tent. I'm just going to stay here. They would turn to things, you know, like drinking. Um, and of course they would turn to straggling. Um, and one of the things that I tried to point out in my book, um, is that, you know, we've typically, um, taken a command framed view of straggling in the literature, which is understandable because straggling is detrimental to armies trying to do their jobs and pursue um, campaigning. Um, and of course, from the command perspective, it's very um, detrimental and challenging to discipline, which is necessary. Um, however, I point out from the soldier's point of view, um, their task um, of soldiering was extremely uncomfortable and very destructive to their mental and physical health. And for many of them, um, they felt themselves reaching a breaking point where they felt like, I cannot continue to do my job because my spirits are so low or my body is so dysfunctional. And they would leave the ranks um, for a few days um, or a few hours, whatever it was, right? They would, they would slip from the ranks and they'd take care of business. <laughs> they would, you know, if they, um, if the diet was what was ailing them, they would find fresh fruits and vegetables or, you know, they'd find a civilian, um, get fresh milk, whatever it was from them. Um, if they were just really sick and they felt like the regimental surgeon either hadn't responded to them at sick call or they hadn't wanted to present because they were fearful of doctors, which we can talk about later, um, then they would go and seek civilian care. And oftentimes the civilian care that was available were, was from uh, African Americans, women, people who were close to the front. And these people would offer them advice, they'd give them medicine, they'd give them care um, that they might be accustomed to from back home. And for many soldiers, this meant they could return to the ranks, um, recovered, healthier, better off. Um, so this, of course, created a great amount of tension <laughs> between soldiers and especially senior officers. Um, but as I, as I started to bring up, in 62, you're still at this early phase of the war um, for these soldiers, and um, they were not fans of the medical department. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, again, for them, some of them might have known their regimental surgeon or their assistant um, regimental surgeon from home, um, but for many of them, you know, even the regimental surgeon um, was more of a hostile person because a lot of their, a lot of the soldiers' ailments in 62 were invisible or were at least something that could not easily be confirmed by the regimental surgeon as X disease. 
Um, and in many cases that meant go back to the ranks, you're a malingerer, right? You know, being labeled in such a way that was extremely painful um, to men's sense of honor, right? Basically being called a malingerer was being called a coward. And that is a serious insult that, I mean, I think we still can understand that it's insulting today, but in the 19th century, that was a major affront to honor, right? So there was, again, a lot of tension there. And then when it came to actually being so sick that you might need to go to the hospital, well, soldiers in 62 were extremely afraid of hospitals. They did not have much experience with hostels from their civilian days because um, hospitals before the Civil War were places that mainly people who didn't have families or people who didn't have money um, or people who were wanderers, you know, they were the sorts of people who would end up in hospitals. Most people were cared for at home by country doctors, this sort of thing. Um, so going to the hospital was terrifying and the sorts of rumors that soldiers would talk about, um, you know, rats are going to eat your feet if you were in the hospital and, you know, you're going to be cared for by strangers. And um, so they desperately wanted to avoid that. So even though they were experiencing illnesses, they tended to try to develop informal networks of care where they could take care of each other, turn to civilians for care, and so avoid um, the, the official structures. Yeah, when you start to look at those official structures, it looks really terrible in that, in that stage of the war. This is something we talk about a lot at the National Museum of Civil War Medicine. It's just kind of the, the nightmarish situations of the first year of the war. Uh, right. You're talking about Confederate and Union medical departments that are just incapable of dealing with, as you mentioned, city-sized armies now. Mm -hmm. you know, these are departments that were tiny nubs uh, before yeah. the, the conflict breaks out, and suddenly you have to ramp all of this up and, and escalate and grow all of this infrastructure, and that takes a lot of time. It's painful, and right. that transition in the spring of 1862 in particular is just mm -hmm. not geared to handle tens of thousands of soldiers with symptoms of various forms of disease. Right. And this is one of the things that I love about 62, again, that makes it kind of a special year to do a social history of medicine. Um, and that is, there's all of these um, improvements, if you will, on the horizon, right? I mean, like Jonathan Letterman and, you know, triage and, uh, you know, ambulatory care and all the sorts of things. It's like right on the horizon, right? It's like later 1862. And Hammond, I mean, coming in and um, helping to develop more standards for, um, you know, who's going to be able to be a surgeon. The U.S. Sanitary Commission, having started to do all of these, um, you know, surveys and reports to say, here are problems with cleanliness, here's problems with um, recreation and mental support. And, you know, so these, these things are, in the U.S. in particular, starting to be rumbles of change. Um, but again, you know, from my my kind of science technology society background, um, that way of looking at things always challenges the narrative of progress, right? Because we have a real urge, um, I think, to look at medicine as a narrative of progress. And part of that is because so many of our Civil War scholarship of medicine has been written by doctors. And, you know, it's great literature. I don't want to knock it and say that it's not. Um, but when you have literature that's written by doctors about medicine, it tends to be like, you know, here's the narrative of progress. Things are getting better and better and better. And STS would say, well, um, doctors are humans. Diagnosis and treatment are technologies, right? They're products of human knowledge. And medicine is an art. And science is not God, right? So these are all culturally confined things. You know, each person has a different perspective. And from the soldier's perspective, they're not necessarily seeing these improvements and, you know, may not experience them as improvements. If you're, um, say, a Black Southerner, um, you know, or a Black soldier in the future, um, a lot of these um, so-called improvements are not going to be for you, right? You're going to be neglected. Um, if you're a, a Black American, you're seen as, having um, you know, more resistance to Southern disease environments and therefore you're left to suffer, right? So it really depends on the perspective and from soldiers' perspectives in 62, they don't really see these so-called improvements percolating. Um, I mean, one, one thing I think they did see was that, for instance, on the US side when Letterman um, came in to the Army of the Potomac, uh, 
then you start to see more emphasis on fruits and vegetables. And that did alleviate scurvy, right? So those kinds of things the soldiers could feel and discern. And I mean, the same on the Confederate side, when Lee um, started you know, overseeing um, what then became the Army of Northern Virginia, that meant greater discipline and more emphasis on camp hygiene and those sorts of things. And that was helpful in some ways for soldiers. I was really struck by what you said there about, you know, the, the narrative of progress. Mm -hmm. and, and just thinking about, this is something we've been talking about at the museum as well. Uh, part of our mission is to talk about from the past to the present and kind of, you know, looking back to the past and seeing and learning lessons from it, taking, deriving things that we can learn. And I think this is one that, you know, touching on the experience of soldiers in 1862 and, and the military medical situation and comparing it to our own time period today, I think kind of bears this out a bit where we have this narrative of like medicine in 2020 is better than it ever was ever before. We have no new lessons to learn from history. And then we get to this pandemic and then it's all of a sudden, we don't have supplies, we don't have infrastructure to deal with this. And then it's like, oh, you know, for, for me as a, as a public historian working in Civil War history, this has suddenly opened my eyes to a lot of things to say, oh, this is what it must have felt like, you know, to, to live through a crisis like that where you, you don't have the answers. And it's not this narrative of progress where it's like, of course, then the next thing fell into line. This is hard work. This is you know, a lot of blood, sweat, and tears going into making these changes, and they're not necessarily written in stone that they're going to happen. They take investment, both in terms of human resources, in terms of financial resources, in terms of, you know, new science and technology being thrown at these kind of problems. And, and I, I just, you know, this is why I was so excited to have you on, just because that there is, I think, a lot we can take away today from mm -hmm. the topic that, that you looked at in your, in your book. I agree. And one of the things that really struck me is that, again, we tend to think of ourselves as superior, you know, to people of the past. Oh, we understand uh, health so much better than soldiers did, right? And especially because they're in this transition period um, in the development of science and medicine, where it's like, in just a decade, people are going to start to understand vector-borne illness and insect-borne illness. Um, but for the soldiers, what they are conceiving is that swamps are bad. Um, when you are in a swamp, you should drain it, right? If, if you are camped in an area that is socked in with water, then you are going to get sick with fever. And it's like looking at that understanding, they're not far off from what then, you know, some of the scientific discoveries of the 1870s would show, right? Um, no, it's not rotten air, foul air wafting off the swamps, but it is mosquitoes, right? And mosquitoes are attracted to standing pools of water. So what soldiers were doing was um, incredibly sensible to them and still looking at us. Um, and, and moreover, their conceptions of mental and physical health being linked, um, that is an understanding we are coming back around to as a 21st century people. We're understanding that, for instance, gut health has a major effect on mental health, right? And these are things that 19th century people um, understood as well, right? But just in a different, through a different avenue. Um, so, and I, I always say to people, to my, when I'm explaining this to my students, I say, um, in, in just a few decades, chemotherapy is going to appear just as barbaric as, as bleeding was in the 19th century. Because, I mean, it's the best we've got right now, but it is so destructive to human bodies, right? But we got to do it because, you know, it's, it's the major treatment for cancer right now. Yeah, and this is what we always get at the, at the museum when we have visitors come in and we talk about you know, treatments like mercury and, and mm -hmm. other things uh, like that poisons in the body. And we know that, you know, <laughs> there's not a lot of, uh, you know, proof backing up that those were effective because they weren't effective. Um, but, you know, we look back on them the way future people will look back on us today. And that's, you know, this, this, we're not at peak medicine, you know, it's, <laughs> no. it's, we're, we're, you know, we're ever evolving and our understanding of the natural world is, is ever changing. And it's important to recognize when we as historians are looking back and, and I, I think for everyday people looking back, it's important as well to understand that they were working with all of the knowledge that had been compiled before that at that point 
And we are working with all of the knowledge that we have compiled. And we learn from the Civil War, and we learn from the 155 years of knowledge afterwards. Yeah. It's, it, it, you know, you can't judge them by those, by 21st century eyes, especially with medicine. Um, and I yeah. think, as you mentioned, I mean, it's, it's, it's great to say, you know, to, to point out that soldiers away from the medical professionals, the soldiers kind of had an inherent understanding they understood because they were in those environments. They understood that there was these connections. They didn't, they didn't know why, but there are those connections uh, mm -hmm. that, that were being made about environment and connections to, to health. Um, one other thing I want to mention before I kind of move on to our next question here, and this is uh, when reading your book, going back, you reference a soldier that uh, and you used his uh, diary, um, someone that I'm have focused on a lot in my studies and his uh, Corporal Henry Kaiser of the 96th Pennsylvania. Um, mm -hmm. He's from my hometown, uh, Wiccanisco uh, Township in Pennsylvania. And uh, I have to say, reading through your book and gave me a new appreciation for his diary, which I have a digital copy of. Mm -hmm. And I would have to say that 1862 time period that he's living through that you're talking about in the book is one of the lowest moments in the war for him. And it is because he is sick with chronic diarrhea and trying to march and fight in the seven days. And I just can't imagine that kind of experience that, that, you know, of what it must have been like to have to leave the ranks to go and, you know, defecate your guts out um, off to the side and then be expected to pick up the musket and go back to the fight. And that is being seen on, on in tens of thousands of soldiers during the war. It's mind boggling to me. Yeah, I, I refer to them, I think, in my book as the walking sick. Um, you know, so many of our statistics that we have about sickness in the ranks um, are based on, you know, official reports. And um, it's, it's folly um, to only focus on those because the men who are having that kind of experience where they were desperately ill, and any of us would be home from work, lying on our bed, moaning, um, they are having to do their job in, you know, um, whether it be marching or uh, sleeping on the ground or participating in combat, whatever it is, they're doing that when they are incredibly ill, but they're not considered ill enough um, to leave the ranks. It's just, and it's, yeah, it's, I mean, I think it's mind boggling. And of course they're down, right? Of course morale bottoms out in those kind of situations, because how can you possibly keep your spirits up when you feel so desperately ill. Yeah, and it's it's just uh, thinking of the seven days as well, you know, to, you add in defeat after defeat to it, and you can just imagine this culmination. And I think this is a part that I think your, your book and research on kind of environmental connections to the Civil War is really important because from the military perspective, you know, we, we think of these soldiers as being defeated, Union soldiers in the seven days as being defeated. Mm -hmm. They've been right. in battle constantly, but there's also all of these other challenges they're facing because of the nature of the terrain and the environment they are fighting in is just so miserable. Uh, in addition to the, you know, the having to go out and fight an enemy that is determined to kill you. Right. And I think um, for me, one of the things that's really important, again, at looking at people in their specific historical context is understanding that what we expect might be traumatic for them may not be what they experienced as traumatic. So for instance, you know, again, talking about narratives of progress, um, we consider ourselves so advanced because we have post-traumatic stress, right, as a diagnosis. And yes, it's helpful, and I don't want to denigrate that because it was a very important product um, of post-Vietnam negotiations between um, suffering veterans, um, psychologists and psychiatrists, this need for um, financial aid when people were losing their jobs, et cetera. So it's an, it's an important specific product. But if you look at what Civil War soldiers were saying, um, for them, this kind of suffering, this mundane suffering, right, um, of being sick all the time and not being able to be cared for by your family, which is what they were used to, right, this dislocation from home when they had been profoundly, um, you know, rural people, um, that was so disheartening to them and, and so traumatic. That, you know, when you think about the diagnosis of nostalgia from the 19th century and this idea of being so homesick and so lonesome that you could die, right? We look at that and we're like, that's crazy. And it's like, well, no, it wasn't crazy to them. 
um, they were, you know, having this experience of dislocation and profound um, illness um, that they often couldn't get any care for. And that was incredibly depressing to them. Right, understandably so. So I want to pull back a little bit and, and look at a bit of the kind of bigger picture here. So from all of the work that you've done in, in your career so far, you know, why, why do you think it's important to analyze where medical care and environmental histories collide? Well, I, I frankly don't think you can understand 19th century health without environmental history, um, without some understanding of, of environmental history, because 19th century Americans understood there to be connections between environment um, and their health. And so um, treatments were often modeled on that, you know, understandings, again, formation of knowledge was often centered around that. Um, so, you know, I already mentioned this idea that certain climates and locations could make people sick. Um, and that, you know, one way um, to deal with that would be to withdraw yourself um, from that location. And of course, the classic example um, is that for, for instance, the South Carolina seacoast, um, that rich white plantation owners um, would remove themselves um, from those locations in the summer to avoid sickness and possibly death. And meanwhile, they would leave enslaved people there um, to suffer because there was a conception um, that, that black bodies were, were somehow impervious to these kinds of um, assaults of fevers. And, you know, so their, their basic understandings of health were bound up um, in, in the environment. And if we don't understand that, then we're going to have a difficult time understanding um, the medical narrative, right? And how lay people and doctors were, were understanding these sorts of things. Um, when I looked at physicians, um, like I said, most of that got cut from the book. Um, but appeared in other places. But I was really fascinated by this group of doctors who participated in the U.S. Sanitary Commission um, because there was, they were the specific group who were trying to establish their expertise in a time when there was um, tremendous fighting over who qualified as a doctor, right? Because the Jacksonian era had sort of uh, decimated, um, you know, legal definitions, state legal definitions of what it meant to be a doctor. And there were all these competitions from homeopaths, et cetera, um, you know, nature cure, all these sorts of stuff were, were cropping up. And so they wanted to establish themselves as experts, particularly in the context of the Civil War, because they had studied the Mexican-American War and they said, guess what? Most soldiers die from disease. If we're not focused on disease, then that is going to happen again in this war. Um, and of course, no one wants to hear that. They want to focus on combat um, and the sort of glory um, of war wounds, etc. But this group of doctors were people who had been educated in Europe, particularly France, but also some in England. And they had learned um, more open-mindedness toward, um, you know, a multiple therapeutics. So they were more interested in um, using nature cures and using emerging science and these sorts of things um, as new standards of their excellence and their expertise. Um, so environmental history also finds its way into, you know, this kind of intellectual path um, and the path toward um, the development of expertise and the merging of science and medicine as well. Yeah, and that's one of the one of the more important narratives that we talk about at the National Museum of Civil War Medicine are all of these different factors that are being that are coming into play that are going to ultimately help to reshape medicine coming out of the Civil War and, and heading towards the the twentieth century. So, for those of you who are still with us watching, uh, if you are interested in Nature's Civil War, uh, this book that we've been talking about today, you can go over to the comments section. Uh, wherever that will be on the video. And uh, you can pick up Katie's book and, and read more about this topic. It is a fascinating read. I, I think all of you who have been watching these videos are really going to enjoy this book. So please go on over wherever it is, click that link and, and pick it yourself up a copy.
Uh, before we before we close up today, Katie, I, I would like to to talk to you a little bit, and we've been doing this with many of the scholars that we've been having on. Uh, just kind of letting you talk about any future projects that you may have coming up. Sure. Well, thank you again for having me. This has been delightful. It's been nice to be able to talk to you and um, take a break from parenting my four-year-old at home during this pandemic. <laughs> um, future projects, well, um, I'm sort of finishing up um, a project that's actually quite different from this, and it's a biography of the Confederate General Jubal Early. Um, one way that it does relate to my past work um, is that um, I'm looking at the foundations of the modern um, American historical profession and how Confederates like Jubal Early help to craft our methodological standards, the types of questions that military historians ask, and how white supremacy and some of these Confederate views have been um, codified um, in the modern profession. So again, it's about the creation of knowledge and how is knowledge formed. Um, so that project I'm finishing up, I'm in the writing phase, should be done in a couple years. <laughs> that's, that's the ending phase, sadly, right? Yeah. Um, and then after that, um, I'm gonna be returning to environmental history and medical history. And I'd like to, um, well, I've started doing some research for a project on sailors, Civil War sailors in the salt water and river Navy. And the interactions you know, among their bodies, the environment, and also race, um, since the Navy you know, always had integration. Um, and I'm just, I'm interested, you know, the Navy is very neglected in Civil War scholarship. So, I'm really interested to learn more about the health picture um, among sailors. And again, I'd like it to be a social history. So from the sailors' perspectives. So on the on the Jubal Early project, I think, did I did I spy a coffee mug with Jubal Early? I know, I, I actually hadn't planned that, but <laughs> there, there there's his head. I'm drinking tea from Jubal Early's head. <laughs> <laughs> we have a, a few years back, we had at the, uh, at the museum, we had a beer uh, that was, named for Jubal Early. It was called Bad Old Man Ransom Ale. Yeah. And it was Doesn't sound very tasty, but <laughs> it, it I, was. I don't want to I don't want to throw anyone under the bus, but it wasn't tasty. It was it was uh it was salty and which I feel is appropriate. That is that, there for, you go. Jubal Early. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but uh but we still have a few shirts available with um, Bad Old Man with his face on it. So I'll have to save you one. Okay, I'll have to save you <laughs> one. Once the pandemic's over, if it will ever end, uh, we'll, I'll make sure you get, uh, you get one of those shirts. Thank you. I feel like I deserve one after spending nearly a decade with, with Lee's bad old man. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, the, the, the Naval Project also sounds, uh, sounds fantastic. I, I just did a, a piece for our blog and did a presentation a few years back about the uh, USS Red Rover um, mm. on the Mississippi and its tributaries. And I, I, it really is a, there's a rich, you know, a rich subject there that has mm -hmm. been, for the most part, pretty neglected, especially from the, the health and medicine perspective. There's not been a lot done um, with, with the Navy, uh, both brown water and blue water uh, during the Civil War. So I, I am really excited to see where that project goes. Right. And it's like, you know, the public health service coming out of, you know, it's just, there's so many connections. And again, the kind of things I love where it's like, how is this knowledge being developed? How is it being codified? How does it become expertise? Um, yeah, it'll be a rich project. Hopefully I'll get to it soon. <laughs> yes, yes. We can all hope for that the pandemic ends so Katie can get to uh, to this next project. It's all um, about me, Jake. <laughs> <laughs> get past the bad old man and on to the, on to the navies. Um, well, Katie, I want to thank you again so much for, for coming on today and for taking time. Um, I know you were probably pretty, pretty excited about taking some time to do non-four-year-old uh, mm -hmm. activities. Yes. Um, but, but thanks for being here. Thank you so much for having me. It was a pleasure. Excellent. And thank you all for watching today. Again, if you do enjoy these videos that we've been doing at the National Museum of Civil War Medicine, please consider becoming a member of the museum. You'll find that in the comments. You can click on a link there and become a member or a donor and support these sorts of videos. If you already have become a member or a donor, thank you very much. That is very much appreciated and you're helping to support these videos. And you can also support us by liking the video and sharing it and subscribing to this channel, as well as our other social media networks as well. This is Jake Wynn from the National Museum of Civil War Medicine signing off. We'll see you next time.